have uh, the distinct honor uh, of introducing our speaker today, Russell Portnoy. So um, introducing Dr. Portnoy is a big job because there's a lot to say about him. Uh, and I guess the first instinct I had was to remark on uh, what are fantastic uh, colleague he is, uh, and clinician, uh, and uh, just an incredibly conscientious institutional uh, participant um, who is, as I'm sure we all agree, incredibly generous with his time and expertise, um, what he's done for the Department of Medicine uh, and the training programs uh, is, is really something that uh, is um, an incredible uh, benefit for us. And so as part of the introduction, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you, Russell, for everything you've done for the department and for our training programs. Um, you want to talk about what an incredibly nice guy he is, uh, what a interesting sense of humor he has and that he brings to everything. Uh, and then there's everything else. So everything else begins with uh, earning his medical degree at the University of Maryland, uh, where he was elected to AOA, uh, then completing an internship, uh, which we now call a preliminary uh, in medicine, uh, at St. Luke's Hospital here in New York. Uh, he completed a uh, residency in neurology at Albert Einstein. Uh, and then served an additional year as chief resident in neurology at Einstein. Um, completed a fellowship in pain and neuro-oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, since 1997, he's been the chairman of the Department of Pain, Medicine, and Palliative Care here at Beth Israel. Uh, that's notable because uh, we were, when founded, and remain the only academic uh, pain and palliative care medicine department in the country. Um, and that's largely uh, thanks to Russell's leadership and initiative and vision. Uh, he holds appointments uh, as professor of neurology and professor of anesthesia at Albert Einstein. Uh, he's also the chief medic, his second job, he's also the chief medical officer of MJHS Hospice and Palliative Care. Uh, he's the editor in chief of the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management, which is an international peer reviewed journal. Uh, he has edited or co authored 20 books. 400 papers, including uh, over 200 peer-reviewed articles. Um, and he's either a founding member or a past or present board member of every major pain and palliative care organization I think that probably ever was, um, including um, winning a Lifetime Excellence Award for Clinical Investigation uh, from the American Pain Society and the Distinguished Service Award from that same organization. Uh, and uh, another way I know him, just to, to show you the saturation of your, uh, of your reputation, uh, my father, who is a CL psychiatrist who specializes in uh, end-of-life care, when I returned to Beth Israel after I'd been here for a little while, he said to me, did you meet Russell Portnoy? And I said, I said oh, yeah, I know, I know Russ pretty well. He said, and? And I said, well, <laughs> he, he breathes the same air as we do, and, uh, you know, and uh, he's a regular person. And, uh, but we all know that that's partially true, but that's also partially not true because he's so exceptionally accomplished and uh, such a wonderful colleague. So without further ado, Dr. Portnoy, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's about the nicest introduction I have ever heard. In fact, could you do that again? That was really wonderful. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to update you on an area of medicine that has exploded in the past 25 years. Uh, we can really spend an hour or more talking about any one of the categories of medications that I'm going to speak about, the non-opioid analgesics, the so-called adjuvant analgesics or non-traditional analgesics, and of course opioid analgesics are in the press all the time because of this uh, extraordinary problem we're having in the U.S. of increasing use, which is being supported by the pain community, but being accompanied at the same time by uh, rising prescription drug abuse, which is concerning all of us. So I could come back on several occasions and go through each of those categories. What I thought I would do today is just to provide you with a broad overview of some of the more uh, recent advances, some of the things I think are most important at the bedside in terms of treating the problems of chronic pain. 
So I'll talk very briefly about the epidemiology of chronic pain, talk a little bit about assessment issues, and then talk about NSAIDs, the so-called adjuvant analgesics or non-traditional analgesics, and then opioids. First of all, it's very important to recognize that we have in the United States and actually in the world an, an immense public health problem uh, of chronic pain. The data are absolutely compelling. They come from multiple countries, and they're both recent data and going back 50 years. We have an extraordinary proportion of the U.S. adult population reporting that they live with pain every day and that pain disables them to some extent. For example, I show you one study here, which was from the WHO. I'm only showing it to you because it's so large in scope. Uh, over 5,000 primary care patients from 15 sites in 14 countries uh, who answered questions about pain. 22% had persistent pain, which was pain for greater than six months associated with utilization of health care for pain or disability. And pain-related uh, distress was also highly common. If you look at the health status of patients with pain, this is just another study to give you a sense. Um, if you look at uh, limitations of activity, look at the self-report of fair or poor health, or look at serious psychological distress, patients who have back pain, the dark bars, are far more, far more likely to report impairment in those areas than patients without back pain. And this increases as the population ages. So when you take the, when you take the reality of a prevalence of chronic pain, which in various studies has ranged between 15% and 40% of the U.S. population, and when you look at the disability associated with chronic pain, which by and large overall has been about 30%, but clearly is age-related, and you add to that the aging of the U.S. population, you should get a sense of the immensity of the chronic pain problem. It is the number one reason that people will come to see you in your office. And if you spend your career focused only on medical issues without focusing on pain as illness, then you're not going to help most of the patients who come to your office as much as you might otherwise. I'll just repeat that because this is so important. I, I can tell you, I've been doing the pain business thing for 30 years almost, and I can tell you that a watershed in terms of the in terms of the intellectual paradigm for pain happened about 10 years ago when the professional community involved with this began to promote the concept that pain should be viewed as an illness in its own right. Pain as illness. Pain as illness. And, if, and all of you are, are, are imbued with the issue of the chronic illness model. Most of what you deal with is chronic illness. There are very few things that internists cure, all due respect. Uh, mostly you deal with chronic illness. The concept of pain as illness is now deeply imbued in the professional community that deals with pain. It's a very good concept for thinking about why you assess patients and how you develop models, strategies to try to reduce pain and improve function over the course of time. You don't cure chronic pain, you manage it in the same way you manage CHF or renal disease or anything else. So the issue related to pain assessment is to recognize pain as a multidimensional phenomenon that has factors related to tissue injury, factors related to changes in the nervous system and psychological pro processes. It's very important to recognize that pain relates to a higher order construct. If you had invited me to talk about palliative care, I would have shown you the same slide, but in this box I would have put the word suffering. But I'll put the word disability because I'm talking to you about pain writ large. So this higher order construct is the way pain relates to that, and you can see that many other factors contribute to disability, psychological factors, physical and medical comorbidity, psychiatric disorders, and study after study after study have shown that factors that are specific to the individual patient, like social support, coding, coping, adaptation, resiliency, self-efficacy, these things work against the extent to which pain contributes to disability. If you want to understand your patient with chronic pain, you do this kind of assessment. Now, when you do that kind of assessment, you often will identify etiologies for the pain and also comorbidities, especially in an older population. Everybody's got comorbidities. I myself have about 12. I'll share with you over a cup of coffee. So everybody's got comorbidities. And the question is, after you do your pain assessment, are you able to identify a primary therapy to treat the etiology? If your patient is a candidate for joint replacement, chronic hip pain, will be eliminated by it in most people. So if you can treat the etiology in a medically appropriate way, consistent with the patient's wishes and the goals of care, then do that. 
But most patients with chronic pain, the etiology cannot be eliminated, and most patients need symptomatic therapies. And I would hope that all of you, particularly those of you in training, over the course of time will get a comfort level with recognizing the, the innumerable, well, I shouldn't say innumerable, the finite number, but very large number of individual strategies that can be applied to, uh, to treat chronic pain. These include interventional strategies like injection therapies, neuroblockade and implant therapies, rehabilitative approaches like physical therapy or the use of modalities, psychological approaches like CBT, neurostimulatory approaches that range from cutaneous uh, interventions like TENS, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, to implant therapies or trans, the new transcranial direct current stimulation therapies that we offer here at Beth Israel is one of only very few sites in the country doing that complementary and alternative medicine approaches. But of course, being internists and me being a neurologist, what we tend to focus on are drugs. Drugs are my friend. I've been playing with drugs my whole adult life. And I think that anybody who wants to treat patients well gains a comfort level with, uh, with drug therapy, which is also, also includes a healthy respect. Because drugs can do a lot of harm, but drugs are clearly, to me, when, when administered in a way that's thoughtful and associated with careful monitoring over time, it is the avenue to help patients dramatically. So all of you should have a skill set in using opioids, non-opioids, and the so-called adjuvant analgesics. So let's start talking first about non-opioid analgesics. These are very familiar to you, but I, I just want to talk about some of the new data out there, some of the things that are, you've all, I think, been dealing with. The non-opioid analgesics in the United States include acetaminophen and the non anti-inflammatory drugs. There's a very popular drug elsewhere called dipyrone that used to be available in the U.S., not available anymore. But in the U.S., we have these drugs. Uh, I will talk about acetaminophen, although you know it's been in the press a lot because of the concern about unintentional hepatotoxicity from uh, patients taking more acetaminophen than they should. Uh, that will likely make, there'll be some changes, I think, in over-the-counter medications over time as a result of that. But let's talk about non anti-inflammatory drugs. So one of the important advances of the last 20 years was the recognition that these drugs work both peripherally and centrally. They inhibit both peripheral and central cyclooxygenase and reduce prostaglandin formation. And a second important advance was to recognize that cyclooxygenase has multiple isoforms in the body at least three have been identified now. There's actually some data about additional isoforms. COX-3 has been identified in the CNS and is believed to be the cyclooxygenase isoform that's most involved with the, the uh, mode of action of acetaminophen. That's why acetaminophen is not a peripheral anti-inflammatory drug. It doesn't seem to impact on these isoforms. But COX-1 and COX-2 are in the periphery. COX-1 is constitutive in many tissues and has physiological functions. So it's there all the time and it works to maintain normal homeostasis. COX-2 is constitutive in some tissues, but it's also inducible. And it's the major isoform that's induced by the inflammatory cascade. So it's been known for many, many years that if one was able to create a molecule that only impacted on COX-2 and didn't impact on COX-1, the likelihood is that you'd be able to have an anti-inflammatory effect with fewer downsides because you wouldn't, in, you wouldn't inhibit the isoform that's constitutive in maintaining, for example, the normal lining of the stomach. This has been known for probably close to 50 years. And what has happened over time is that the pharmaceutical industry has developed many of these molecules that have gotten progressively more selective for COX-2. But the important, one of the important points to recognize is that all NSAIDs inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2. And what we're talking about is the relative degree to which they inhibit these two isoforms. And the, and the COX-2 selective drug, drugs that you know have been in the press quite a lot in the last decade, the COX-2 selective drugs really reflect a labeling decision on the part of the federal authorities. Right? The COX-2 selective drugs are not only inhibiting the COX-2 isoform of cyclooxygenase, they're just more selective. And in fact, a celecoxib, it, which, Celebrex, is only slightly more selective than a drug that exists on the market now, which is meloxicam or Mobic. 
but Mobic is, is designated a non-selective COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitor, and Celecoxib is designated as a selective drug. The two drugs that have, were on the U.S. market and were taken off the U.S. market, Valdecoxib or Bextra and Rofacoxib or Vioxx, were much, much, much more selective for COX-2 than Celecoxib, but also more problematic in terms of side effects, as we'll talk about in a second. So in the United States, as you know, we're very fortunate because we're a country that likes drugs and also um, uh, allows many different drugs in, in the same class to be on the market. So we have a variety of the non-select, the so-called non-selective COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors. We have one non-acidic drug, Nabumatone. This one is about 1,200 times more selective for COX-1, COX-2 than COX-1, but it was on the market before the pharmaceutical companies thought to ask the FDA to label it a COX-2. If nabumatone was now approved, there'd probably be a COX-2 selective drug. It's just not, right? We also have salicylates like aspirin, choline magnesium trisalicylate, and salicylate. Propion and these, these two drugs you probably know, choline magnesium trisalicylate and salicylate. This is trilisate and disalcid. These are non-acetylated salicylates, and so they have very little impact on the stomach and no impact on platelets. Probionic acids like ibuprofen and naproxen. Acetic acids like indomethacin and sulindac and diclofenac. Oxycams like peroxicam, phenomates like mephenamic acid. Many different NSAIDs. So what's a clinician to do? How do you select these drugs? On what basis do you try to choose the drug for the patient in a way that's going to optimize the therapeutic index? So first, you have to understand what the properties of all the NSAIDs are. And again, very familiar to you. They're nonspecific analgesic. They have probably have greater effectiveness in inflammatory pains, but please remember that the analgesic efficacy of an NSAID is not dependent on the, on the uh, existence of inflammation. Uh, one of the very first patients I ever took care of with chronic pain was a patient who had an enucleation for a tumor in the eye and developed a post-enucleation neuropathic pain syndrome in the orbit, right? A traumatic, painful mononeuropathy related to surgery. And this patient was going around looking for relief, and none of the doctors helped her. So she went and got herself some ibuprofen, and guess what? She had dramatic pain relief from the ibuprofen. She then came and saw me in consultation, and I told her ibuprofen doesn't work for neuropathic pain, so stop that. And she did, and she had a huge pain flare, and she said, where'd you get your training? And went back on the ibuprofen. So, NSAIDs are all nonspecific analgesic, they're, but they're at higher doses, they're anti-inflammatory, so theoretically they'd be more effective for inflammatory pains. They all have dose-dependent effects with a ceiling dose. That means there's a dose above which additional increments in dose don't provide any additional analgesia. The dose guidelines, the dosing guidelines in the package insert try to define the minimal effective dose and the ceiling dose for the average patient. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the patient in front of you, right? There's marked individual variation in response to the different drugs, and some of that variation, but not all of that variation, is determined by their rel the relative COX-1 and COX-2 selectivity. So how do you select these drugs if they all have similar properties? Well, most people nowadays would say focus on toxicity. See if you can select drugs that have the least likelihood of producing uh, adverse effects. And so you need to have some grasp of the potential for adverse effects associated with the NSAIDs. So all of these drugs, all of the NSAIDs, including the COX-2 selective drugs, do increase the risk of gastroduodenopathy over non-treatment. All of them do that. And they have a risk of major bleeding. And importantly, and uh, this is something that I was unaware of until I saw the data, uh, the, there is an increased risk of lower GI bleeding as well as upper GI bleeding. Yeah. Lower GI bleeding as well as upper GI bleeding. And the, and the risk of gastrotinopathy, as you probably know, takes the form of just pyrosis or reflux symptoms all the way to massive hemorrhage, either from the upper GI tract or the lower GI tract. The people who are at increased risk of major side effects include the elderly, those with pre-existing GI disease or sensitivity to the NSAIDs, and those treated with corticosteroids. Also, those treated longer at higher doses. And the most important clinical point is that there's no correlation between the symptoms and the occurrence of massive GI hemorrhage. 
which means that if you're waiting for a patient to tell you that they have burning epigastric pain in order to reduce their risk of major hemorrhage, you're going to be wrong about half the time, right? About half the time, major GI hemorrhage is preceded by no premonitory symptoms. So you have to reduce risk by using lower doses uh, and, and, uh, and, and in other ways. So one way you reduce the risk is by using a, a COX-2 selective drug. That, that um, a concept that a COX-2 drug, a drug that's relatively more selective for cyclooxygenase 2 than cyclooxygenase 1 is less likely to produce ulcer disease has been borne out in many studies. These two studies provided the pivotal data that made the FDA um, approve rofecoxib and celecoxib. Uh, this is the incidence of GI lesions with placebo. The, the high bars are the incidence of uh, GI lesions with the so-called non-selective drugs, in one case naproxen and in one case ibuprofen. And the lower bars are the incidence of the GI lesions associated with either rofecoxib or celecoxib. So these studies, which were carefully done controlled trials, demonstrated to the FDA that a, that a drug that is relatively more selective at COX-2 was going to be relatively safer for the stomach, which is how the, how the reality of the COX-2 inhibitors uh, emerged. That's why we got a label that said COX-2. You can also reduce toxicity by giving a patient a PPI, misoprostol, or a high-dose H2 blocker. That's a bit controversial, but there's at least some studies to suggest that relatively higher dose famotidine, for example, reduces GI um, um, toxicity. If a patient has already had a GI hemorrhage, uh, there was a study that looked at the extent to which uh, a PPI versus a COX-2 inhibitor uh, reduced re-bleeding. And you can see that celecoxib was a bit more effective in reducing re-bleeding than was the PPI. And what some people would say is if you really, most, I think most people in the United States would say if you really want to reduce risk, you use celecoxib and a PPI. But that, uh, that has not been studied to my knowledge. So what do we know about risk? We know, that, we know that all of the NSAIDs have GI risk, but if you want to reduce the risk, you can choose a selective COX-2, so-called selective COX-2 inhibitor, which is in this country celecoxib and or select a, a PPI for co-therapy. What about other risks associated with uh, the NSAIDs? All the NSAIDs produce a, ble a bleeding diathesis, but the COX-2 selective drugs have lesser risk, lesser risk of this. All the NSAIDs have renal toxicity. The COX-2 are not renal sparing. So the COX-2, cyclooxygenase 2, is constitutive in kidney. The two major organs that have COX-2 as constitutive are kidney and brain. And so COX-2 is constitutive in kidney, and you get the same toxicity with COX-2 inhibitors. And very importantly for, and, and this is the more recent information about the NSAIDs, we now know that all the NSAIDs presumably have the capacity to increase the risk of cardiovascular events, including myocardial infarction, angina, stroke, TIAs, peripheral vascular disease, and they all have the risk of, of, of um, worsening heart failure or producing heart failure in predisposed patients. And probably these effects are due both to the prothrombotic effects produced by NSAIDs and also the hypertensive effects produced by NSAIDs. So the question is, can you select a drug that reduces the risk of this outcome? Well, it's very hard to say because there have now been many, many epidemiologic studies, and I'm just showing you one here which was based on, uh, on Medicare claims data to show that all of the NSAIDs essentially can re increase the risk of prothrombotic effects. This relates to acute my myocardial infarction and compared to use in the remote past in the methicin, sulindac, meloxicam, rofecoxib, which is a COX-2 selective drug, all of the drugs increase it. I just, when, when, when this concern about cardiovascular toxicity came out, it was focused on rofecoxib and I read many, many reports, including many uh, didactic reports in throwaway journals, that suggested that prothrombotic effects occurred only with the so-called selective COX-2 inhibitors. And that was just incorrect. That was just wrong. COX-2 inhibition is presumably 
the mediating mode of action for prothrombotic effects. But all of these drugs are both COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors. So all NSAIDs increase the risk of cardiovascular toxicity, and all NSAIDs increase the risk of heart failure. So this is a problem, obviously. So the question is, do the data point in any direction for, for decreasing the risk? And I don't have the slides here, but I will share with you that several large epidemiologic studies in the last couple of years suggest that uh, naproxen has the least risk of cardiovascular toxicity. No one knows why, to my knowledge, but the least risk of cardiovascular toxicity. It's also important to point out that um, it now seems clear that the uh, NSAIDs may interfere with the antithrombotic effect of aspirin. This is, uh, and, and this is certainly true for ibuprofen, and it may be true for other drugs. Right before this lecture, in order to appear very up-to-date to you, I reviewed the literature, and uh, I found uh, several papers that gave conflicting results. So the problem is that we don't, all we know for sure is that ibuprofen inhibits uh, the antithrombotic effects of aspirin, but we don't know for sure about other drugs. This is an in vitro study, and what you see on the ordinate here is the percent inhibition of, uh, of platelet aggregation produced by aspirin. And in the yellow bars, is what happens if aspirin is added to the in vitro preparation before ibuprofen. So if aspirin is given before ibuprofen, platelets are inhibited. That's what you want low-dose aspirin to do, right? But if ibuprofen is given before aspirin, the inhibitory, the anti-aggregation effects of the aspirin drop down dramatically. Now it's known that ibuprofen and aspirin compete for the same binding site on the platelet. And so if ibuprofen is floating in your blood at the same time as you give somebody a dose of aspirin, it will be in the binding site on the platelet and the aspirin cannot get in. And if the aspirin is metabolized out of the blood before the ibuprofen disappears, the effects of aspirin on the platelets will not be present. So if you have patients taking ibuprofen for their headache, and you have it, and they're also taking low dose aspirin to reduce their risk of cardiovascular toxicity, and you haven't advised them about this timing issue, you've done them a disservice. You have to tell patients you must take your aspirin at least a couple of hours before you take any ibuprofen because they have to swallow, absorb the aspirin. It has to bind to platelets, it bind, binds irreversibly, as you know, and then those platelets are no longer going to aggregate in the same way as the ones that haven't been uh, acetylated. But if you don't tell them that, and they wake up with a headache, uh, mine usually happens just as I'm walking into the office, and they pop that ibuprofen before they take their aspirin, then the aspirin is not going to protect them. And although there are data, for example, that diclofenac doesn't have the same effect, that's one paper that just was published. As I said before, my reading of the, paper, the data, I'd be interested if anybody has any other information. You just can't say for sure yet that the other NSAIDs don't have the same effect. So I would say, since it's not a big deal for most patients to time their aspirin and their NSAID uh, in a way that allows the aspirin a chance to work, that's what you do. You allow the aspirin a chance to work. So how do you develop guidelines given what we know about these drugs? It's very hard because we don't really know enough to minimize risk, and we now know that the risk of NSAIDs is much more than we used to thought, think it was. Uh, you know, it was very well appreciated forever that the NSAIDs can produce peptic ulcer disease, including fatal hemorrhage. It's been appreciated forever that it can produce a whole range of renal toxicities. Now we know that the NSAIDs can also precipitate or, or increase the likelihood of myocardial infarction and, and uh, TIA stroke or peripheral vascular disease that becomes symptomatic. So we have to worry about these drugs. No one should think these drugs are benign. These are not benign drugs. And so a risk-benefit calculation is required in every case. Any patient with a significant cardiovascular history, CHF, renal insufficiency, those patients should be considered as having strong relative contraindications, in, in my view. It doesn't mean you don't use the drugs. We do lots of things that have a relatively higher risk. But you have to make sure that the risk-benefit analysis falls on the side of, of asking patients to take that risk. And I would also suggest that you probably talk to them about risk. <clears throat> 
as, a, as opposed to just treating them or advising them to use an over-the-counter NSAID and without telling them that they're at increased risk. For acute use, short-term use, it's really not a big deal. It doesn't seem to be, uh, it, although obviously you can see effects right away in terms of change in the stomach lining, in terms of change in platelets. The, most of the studies suggest that the adverse effects occur over the course of time. So short-term use has, low, has very low risk. Consider celecoxib for chronic use in the presence of any GI risk factors. Consider naproxen for cardiovascular risk patients. And use the lowest effective dose. I think this is an important thing. If you have a patient with relatively severe osteoarthropathy pain and you want to give them a, a big initial dose, you say, well, start with ibuprofen, six to 800 milligrams four times a day, see how you feel. Then what you should then tell the patient is when you feel better, lower the dose until you're at the minimal dose you need. That would be a good thing to tell patients. Lower the dose until you're at the minimal dose you need. Whether you're giving them naproxen, ibuprofen, Sulindac, diclofenac, whatever you do, tell them to lower the dose until you're at the minimum dose they need because that reduces their risk. Consider gastroprotective therapy and because of the large uh, intra-individual variation and the response to the different drugs, a patient who doesn't benefit from one drug should be considered for another. So there's been stuff happening in the world of NSAIDs, but it's actually paled in comparison to what's been happening in the world of the so-called adjuvant analgesics. And a few years ago, I was asked with a colleague to put together a book chapter for the Oxford Textbook of Palliative Care on the role of adjuvant analgesics for pain management. And as we looked at the literature, it became overwhelming what had happened in the past 50 years in terms of, in terms of both the control trials data and the observational data supporting the use of drugs that were non-traditional analgesics, drugs that might have other uses that become analgesic in certain circumstances. So in an effort to get our, our arms around this, my colleague and I decided that we'd create a, a system for categorizing these drugs. And, um, and here it is. This is the way that I would suggest that you think about the so-called non-traditional or adjuvant analgesics. Some of them are multi-purpose, meaning to say that the data that they're analgesic reflects so many different kinds of pains that you can consider them for any kind of pain syndrome. In other words, they are exactly like the NSAIDs and exactly like the opioids. So a person with low back pain, headache, fibromyalgia comes in, you would say, I could use this, non, this, this adjuvant analgesic, which is a multi-purpose drug. Some of the drugs may or may not be multi-purpose, but they've been studied and are conventionally used in neuropathic pain. Some of the drugs are, have been studied and are conventionally used in musculoskeletal pain. Some are conventionally used in bone pain, some in pain related to bowel obstruction, the latter two categories mostly cancer-related pain, and some have been used in muscle spasm. So we'll go through this list in this order. So, and to try out, what I will hope I will do is just pr provide you with a framework. By the way, if anybody wants these slides or an article about this, just email me because I'm happy to share. Uh, you know, the latest data, at least with house staff, is that you've only been listening to me for eight minutes and then zoned out. So, which is okay because I'm used to that. I'm a parent, um, and that's uh, that's okay. But I, but again, I think if you want to uh, if you want to take a little time afterwards and try to internalize some of this information and increase uh, your experience with these drugs. Just let me know, I'll give you some written materials. So what are the multipurpose analgesics? Corticosteroids, antidepressants, alpha-2 adrenergic agonists, and topical therapies. The, the corticosteroids, I don't really uh, want to spend much time on them because as you know, the risk profile over time with corticosteroids is relatively bad. And as a consequence of that, long-term therapy of corticosteroids for pain is typically used in the context of advanced illness, or if there's a corticosteroid responsive primary illness. So they're used as disease modifying drugs in the non-cancer setting, non-advanced illness setting. But in the advanced illness setting, they're used as primary analgesics. So if you have a patient with advanced illness, for example, a neoplasm who has multifocal bone pain, neuropathic pain, headache, skin pain, capsular pain, any kind of pain, it's a multipurpose analgesic, right, like an opioid. If you have a patient in that context, advanced illness, with pain of any type, low-dose corticosteroid therapy with the intent to continue over time would be considered conventional practice, standard of care. 
On the other hand, if you have somebody with a normal life expectancy and you're worried about the risk-benefit analysis down the road, then you would only consider long-term corticosteroid therapy when it's a disease-modifying agent. Now, um, antidepressants are multipurpose analgesics that have been studied in a very large number of randomized controlled trials. Few have been done in medically ill populations, but there are randomized controlled trials that have been done in low back pain, osteoarthropathy, fibromyalgia, chronic migraine, um, uh, a very large number of, of, of randomized controlled trials. And so we, so we now know that antidepressant drugs, drugs that are on the market to treat depression, are pain relievers. They're painkillers. And um, as you probably know, there are multiple different categories of antidepressant drugs, the tricyclic compounds, the serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, and other drugs that may be more dopaminergic or noradrenergic. Uh, all of these drugs have evidence of analgesic efficacy, but the evidence is by far the best for the tricyclic group and the SNRIs. These are the two groups to consider routinely for any patient with chronic pain. The tricyclic antidepressants come in two flavors, the tertiary amine drugs like amitriptyline or Elevil, imipramine or tofranil, doxepin or Sinequan, and the secondary amine drugs, desipramine or norpramine or nortriptyline or Pamelor. As you probably know, the secondary amine drugs are much, much better tolerated, less sedating, less cardiovascular risk, less hypotension. These drugs are better tolerated. So based on safety and the likelihood of efficacy, I would suggest to you that you think either about adding to your armamentarium for pain management secondary amine tricyclic drugs or the usually well-tolerated selective uh, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Remember, these two categories have the best evidence. The SNRIs tend to be better tolerated than the tricyclics as a group, but the secondary amine tricyclics are usually well tolerated. And so for that reason, I would suggest to you that you think about becoming comfortable with giving patients with any kind of chronic pain one of the secondary amine drugs, desipramine or nortriptyline, or one of the uh, SNRIs, duloxetine or Cymbalta, or the new one on the market, which is Minalsopran or Civella. The data about analgesia is much better for duloxetine than minalsopran, but that may be because it's a newer drug. Pain specialists also tend to use bupropion, Wellbutrin, because it has a good side effect profile. It tends to wake people up, doesn't seem to have much in the way of sexual impairment, and so patients uh, can, and, but there's very, very little evidence that bupropion is analgesic, very little evidence. But pain specialists like it because of that side effect profile. I would suggest, to, to you as a practicing internist that um, trying the zipramine or triptyline and duloxetine in patients with chronic pain would be the way to go initially. And remember that each patient always, with all analgesic drugs, the intra-individual variability across the class is very high. So patients can respond to one but not the other with a good uh, balance between analgesia and side effects. Now another group of multipurpose drugs are the alpha-2 adrenergic agonists. And in this country, we have clonidine, uh, catapress, tizanidine, which is um, a muscle relaxant called Xanaflex, and dexmedetomidine, which is a drug that's typically used in the OR or the ICU setting. It's a parenteral agent. There's a lot of data to show that the alpha-2 adrenergic agonists work for a low back pain, joint pain, headache, and that's why I categorize them as multipurpose drugs. Tizanidine is usually better tolerated than clonidine, but of course, epidural clonidine is actually approved by the FDA as a pain reliever um, that can be added to an implant therapy with a, a neuraxial infusion. So clonidine is approved as an analgesic given spinally, but tizanidine is used off-label for pain in a more uh, routine office-based setting. So if you have a patient with low back pain, for example, you don't have to find muscle spasm to justify a trial of this muscle relaxant, because this muscle relaxant is also an analgesic. The topical adjuvant analgesics are now widely used by pain specialists. And I'll just want to point out to you, there are RCTs supporting 
analgesic benefit in both neuropathic and arthropathic pain. Probably all of you are using the lidocaine 5% patch. It's been around now for uh, 10 years, and it's uh, still a popular um, formulation. This is lidoderm. Capsaicin has uh, been around for much longer, and the low concentration capsaicin formulations that are available in the pharmacy over the counter do have evidence of efficacy in, in analgesic trials. But what's new, what's new in the world is the high concentration capsaicin patch. This is about six months old on the market, and, and it's approved and indicated for the treatment of post herpetic neuralgia. This is a treatment that's done in a procedure room, like our procedure room in the pain practice at PAC. We do it in a monitored setting because if you don't adequately anesthetize the skin, when you put this patch on, there have been patients who have experienced reflex hypertension and reflex tachycardia, as well as very irritating screaming. <laughs> and so you have to have them in a procedure room so the nurse can put her hand over the mouth of the patient. <laughs> now, but you put this patch on for a couple of hours, and uh, the patients, if they have efficacy, the pain relief will last three months or longer. And um, uh, needless to say, pain specialists are already beginning to use the high concentration patch, which is called Cutenza, for off-label uses. Other types of regional neuropathic pain, post-traumatic mononeuropathy, post-surgical mononeuropathy, for example, post-orchotomy pain, post-inguinal, uh, uh, post uh, herniorophy pain syndrome, post ernotomy pain syndrome. So if you have patients with those kinds of pains, this represents a potential advance. It's clearly an advance for post hepatic neuralgia. Off-label use is so new, no one knows yet, but it's a potential advance. Also, topical NSAIDs have been shown in randomized controlled trials to work for arthropathic pain, and so there's a, there's a topical NSAID patch, Flector. There's topical NSAID creams, and these are easily prescribed as well. Now, the second large group of adjuvant analgesics uh, are the ones for neuropathic pain. So they're all the ones I just mentioned, the antidepressants, the alpha-2 adrenergic agonists, the corticosteroids, and the topical agents. And of course, anticonvulsants, cannabinoids, sodium channel blockers, NMD receptor antagonists, and others. And I just want to mention a couple of these classes because they represent important advances. The pain community in several uh, uh, systematic reviews and uh, evidence-based uh, consensus documents have concluded that the gabapentinoid should be the first-line agent for neuropathic pain unless a patient has a clinical depression. If a patient has a clinical depression, then an antidepressant should be the first line. But of course, many patients have both, are given both gabapentin or pregabalin as well as an antidepressant. Combination pharmacotherapy is very common in chronic pain. Combination pharmacotherapy is a good thing as long as you're comfortable that both or all three or all four agents are helping and the, um, and the additive toxicity is not a problem. These, uh, these drugs, pre gabapentin and pregabalin, don't have anything to do with GABA, at least as a mode of action for their pain management. Instead, they are modulators of a small protein that sits on the uh, N-type calcium channel in the CNS. This is called the alpha-2 delta protein. So you may hear the gabapentinoids also being called the alpha-2 delta protein modulators. So the alpha-2 delta protein drugs are the gabapentinoids. So gabapentin and pregabalin, they're less effective than the tricyclics for neuropathic pain. The NNT, I'm sure you all know what NNT is, yes? The NNT for the tricyclics in neuropathic pain is about three. The NNT for gabapentin in, in neuropathic pain is a four to five. So these are not panaceas by any stretch. But the gabapentin and pregabalin, gabapentin and pregabalin are usually preferred because the toxicities are tolerable. They're not meta hepatically metabolized. There are no known drug-drug interactions. Uh, just please remember to titrate the dose. If someone is given 1,200 milligrams of gabapentin and they're not better and they don't have side effects and you stop, it's as if you never gave them a trial. Right? The studies show conclusively that gabapentin usually requires a dose of above 1,800 milligrams a day to work. And pain specialists will commonly push to 3,600 or 4,500 milligrams a day. The highest dose that I personally used was 10 grams a day. That was an accident. <laughs> no harm done, though. No harm done. 
And it was a very happy patient. <laughs> I, of course, needed psychotherapy for a year. Um, and remember that Lyrica pregabalin should be pushed to 600 milligrams. All of the RCTs, like 25 RCTs of pregabalin, were done randomizing patients to 600 milligrams on day one. You know that? I mean, and when you see people prescribing Lyrica at 25 milligrams twice a day, and if it doesn't work, you say it doesn't, it doesn't work, that's, that makes no sense given the pharmacology. Right? You've got to push the dose. So other anticonvulsants have much less data of analgesic efficacy. The newer drugs have better safety profiles. Some of these drugs I'm sure you're using. Lecosamide is the new sodium channel uh, modulator. Uh, Vimpat, there's some evidence of analgesic efficacy for that drug. Seems to be very well tolerated. Uh, oxcarbazepine, trileptal, some analgesic efficacy of this drug. Seems to be quite well tolerated. Topiramate, Topamax, it's approved for migraine headache. Tends to be generally well tolerated. So, again, if you're treating a lot of neuropathic pain, you probably want to get, gain some skills in some of these newer drugs so that you can uh, rotate patients as appropriate. Sodium channel blockers represent another group of drugs used for neuropathic pain. There are a variety of oral drugs on the market. Mexilatine or Mexitil is still used for neuropathic pain, but less so because of the side effect liability. What pain specialists do, however, and what we do in PAC in our pain practice, is offer patients brief IV lidocaine infusion. Brief IV lidocaine infusion has been used since the 1920s for analgesia, for burn pain, for headache, and we use it for all kinds of neuropathic pain. Patients come in, and they might start with a milligram per kilo over a half hour, and then they go up to four milligrams per kilo. NMDA receptor antagonists, everybody was very excited about these drugs 10 years ago. We thought they would cure Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and neuropathic pain. And they did make it on the market for Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease as you know. But in neuropathic pain, it's been disappointing, with one exception, and that's ketamine. Memantine is sometimes used. Memantine is Namenda. It's on the market for dementia. And it is, uh, has some evidence of analgesic efficacy, so it is used, uh, third or fourth line. But IV and oral ketamine is used commonly now by pain specialists and palliative care specialists. It's not a drug that you should use without being uh, mentored in the first or second uses because of its high side effect liability but it's a drug that's now widely being used around the world. Very importantly, if, if there's any controversy among you all about whether or not cannabis is analgesic and cannabinoids are pain drugs, let me disabuse you of any doubts that you have. There is no question that humankind was created with cannabinoid receptors <laughs> in the brain and spinal cord and the periphery. And then when you take cannabis or you have cannabinoids, synthetic or alkaloids, they bind to cannabinoid receptors in the brain, spinal cord, on the peripheral nerve, and on inflammatory cells. And they are both anti-inflammatory and analgesic. Anybody who thinks they are not is either ignorant of the literature or works for the government. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean you make marijuana legal. I'm not advocating that, necessarily. It's a time, different conversation. But uh, cannabinoids are analgesic. Definitely no question. And we have several cannabinoids on the market, including 100% THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. That's a drug called Marinol. That drug is on the market for appetite stimulation and nausea, has some analgesic effects, but usually is not tolerated well enough at the doses that are analgesic. We have another drug called Nabilone on the market. It's an anti-emetic. There is at least one controlled trial showing Nabilone is analgesic. And what's coming very soon, hopefully, is a drug that's approved in the United Kingdom and also in Canada, which is an extract of two cannabis plants. One cannabis plant ha makes a lot of THC. One cannabis plant makes a lot of cannabidiol. You take the two plants, you squeeze them really hard, you mix the juice together, and you spray it in somebody's mouth, and you have a drug. And that drug is now approved in Canada and the UK for spasticity related to multiple sclerosis and pain related to cancer. And we have been the, we have been the uh, lead site on the Phase two national study. And the Phase three national study, the pivotal trial in the United States, will be starting probably in August. And we are, again, the lead site here at Beth Israel. So cannabinoids are analgesic. Uh, Sativex. 
And other drugs for neuropathic pain, uh, baclofen has been around for a very long time. Be good if you knew how to use that drug uh, because it's, um, uh, when used appropriately, it's quite safe. And calcitonin, believe it or not, intranasal calcitonin has been used for, um, for neuropathic pain as well. And there are randomized controlled trials suggesting that calcitonin is analgesic in both RSD and phantom pain. No one knows why that is. And I'll make my last point about these categories of drugs just to show you the importance of trying to understand the pharmacology. Probably all of you use muscle relaxants all the time. Drugs like cyclobenzaprine, flexoril, which is a tricyclic compound, just like an antidepressant. Carisoprodol or phenadrine, methylcarbamol. These are drugs like Norflex, Robaxin, um, Scalaxin. So these drugs are called the muscle relaxants. Guess what their mode of action is? They don't relax muscle. They have no effect on muscle. But what happened, this story may be apocryphal, but I like it so much I'll tell you. Uh, a scientist at one of the companies coming forward with this drug discovered that in an in vitro assay of polysynaptic myogenic twitching, so a little tool where they had a muscle between two poles and then they would they would twitch the muscle with an electric current and then they'd spray the muscle with this compound. The polysynaptic myogenic reflex was inhibited by one of these drugs. And then over coffee later that day, that scientist sat with a marketing person and said, you know, there's a lot of muscle spasm out there. What do you think? And the scientist said, that's your job. 25 years later, we're flooded with muscle relaxants that have no effect on muscle. Now, tizanidine is a re muscle relaxant. It actually does relax muscle. Diazepam is a muscle relaxant. It relaxes muscles. So if you have a muscle spasm, and they do exist, think about tizanidine, which is a multipurpose analgesic, Xanaflex, or think about Valium. These are centrally acting analgesics. They all work for pain. But they should really be called multipurpose analgesics. They just haven't been studied. No one really knows how they work. But they are not work working through muscle relaxation. And so they are just another group of centrally acting analgesics to consider for, um, for acute pain. And obviously, conventional practice, which we all try to adhere to, conventional practice uses them for the short term in patients who have acute musculoskeletal syndrome. So that's how you use them. So what I try to do today is to talk basically about these two large categories, the NSAIDs and the adjuvant analgesics. The NSAIDs are what they are. I think the most important advance that I'm that I would try to convey to you is that they're not safe. Uh, when I trained, NSAIDs were like the default. You know, everybody got an NSAID because they're safe. And if they didn't work, you would think about an opioid. If they didn't work, you might think about an antidepressant or a nerve block. Well, that thinking was flawed thinking. NSAIDs in some patients are far more risky than opioids. NSAIDs in some patients are far more risky than a nerve block. So, the bottom line is you have to recognize the risk of gastroduodenopathy, nephropathy, and cardiovascular toxicity and make a judgment on a case-by-case -case basis and communicate with the patient. And the other thing I wanted to impart to you is that this area of non-traditional analgesics has exploded. And since, every, since most of the patients who come to the office have chronic pain, that's the most common reason people see you, uh, to the extent that you feel comfortable in using antidepressants, alpha-2 adrenergic agonists, topical therapies as nonspecific drugs, and those drugs plus anticonvulsants plus a cannabinoid plus an NMDA receptor antagonist plus a sodium channel blocker, all those other drugs, you have more tools to offer patients who have chronic pain with the hope that you can temper their pain and reduce the impact of pain, thereby really coming to grips with this concept of pain as illness. Thanks very much for your attention. No questions. One question. Right, right. So high, uh, low dose aspirin is is uh, antithrombotic. High dose aspirin um, is presumably not. Uh, none of the NSAIDs are antithrombotic. Um, meaning to say they don't have the same pro uh, prophylactic impact on cardiovascular toxicity as aspirin does. Um, if you give aspirin along with an NSAID, you increase the risk of gastroduodenopathy. If you give aspirin plus celecoxib, uh, 
you eliminate the benefit to the stomach that's produced by using the, the COX-2 selective drug. So the answer to your question is, I really think you have, what I would suggest is, is to think about it uh, in sequence. You know, does this patient warrant treatment with uh, cardioprotective aspirin? If so, it should be given. Now the question is, if a patient might benefit from an NSAID as well, would I give celecoxib plus a PPI because I'm no longer reducing risk by just giving the celecoxib? And if I'm doing that, can I tell the patient to take it two hours later? That's the only, if you have a patient who has both pain from osteoarthropathy and risk factors for cardiovascular disease, I, where I'm at now, just re, with review of this literature, low-dose aspirin, a PPI, a choice of celecoxib, and educate the patient to take their drugs for pain two hours after their aspirin. Do you think raising the dose of aspirin Right, to my, to my knowledge, does anybody know differently than I can? Yes. Right. I mean, my, my understanding is that uh, aspirin at therapeutic doses used for rheumatoid arthritis, for example, is not cardioprotective. So tramadol or Ultram, and also a newer drug called Tepentadol or Nusinta, these are both new centrally acting drugs with unique mechanisms. About 40% of their mechanism is binding to the mu receptor and about 60% is that they're reuptake blockers of monoamines like serotonin and norepinephrine. Because they interact with the mu receptor, Tepentadol, the new one, got a Schedule II. Ultram, which has a very similar mechanism, wasn't scheduled, but that was because it was on the European market for about 14 years before it came to the U.S. and was shown to have very little abuse. So the bottom line is that they're centrally acting drugs, they work, you can't push the dose up freely like with a pure mu agonist because of the other mechanism. They produce seizures at higher doses, and they're fine to use as um, centrally acting drugs. They can be abused. They're probably less likely to be abused than pure mu agonist by people who are predisposed to that, but no one really even knows that so well. Yes? One of the problems I see in the community in patient and care for by pain specialists is the, um, the fact that they, the patients frequently come with significant psychiatric problems. Whether they started with it or not, there are very significant Honestly, I don't see enough referrals to psychiatry. From pain specialists. pain specialists. And I don't think pain specialists are actually trained, as a rule, in psychiatry during their fellowship training. So it really leaves me wondering why. Um, I don't think they're well equipped for the psychiatric realities, yeah. which is one aspect of the question. The other one is, it almost seems that like they rigor that you should be using an antidepressant in chronic pain. But I don't know that that really is so, or that literature has evolved studying that combination, that polypharmacy. Yeah. So what about the psychiatric aspect? So, so the, first, the first question is, is one I would respond to, that if the shoe fits, you wear it. Um, the pain community has evolved in the past quarter century to be highly interventional. 70% um, of anesthesiologists. The training is highly interventional. And the financial incentives uh, produced by the, the payer system drive pain specialists to rely on interventions rather than on talking and pharmacotherapy. So uh, as a community of specialists, we're in trouble. The good news is that the ACGME has recognized that. There's, uh, there are some very significant changes that are now working their way through the ACGME, including a two-year fellowship, where one year would be interventional, one year would be based on psychological techniques, pharmacotherapy. Um, the, I think in the near term, my advice, frankly, in the near term is no know who you refer to. You have to know who you refer to. You can't assume you tell a patient, well, you, you, did you find a pain specialist in Queens? Go to that person. That person may have no skills in drug therapy, no skills in psychiatric assessment, may not believe in referring a patient. It's really, the, the, we're not in a really good place in terms of the specialty. The answer to your second question about um, antidepressants, so about 60, per, it, if, if you look at people referred to pain clinics, 60, 70 percent have comorbid psychiatric disease. Either, most likely, um, well, either access one, access two, or both. <laughs> so depressive disorder and anxiety disorder, very common. In the community, it's probably much less. 
So my own feeling about that is what you alluded to, basically. You've got to assess the patient. You can use an antidepressant without a comorbid psychiatric disease as a primary analgesic. If you're doing that, tell the patient and monitor pain. If you're treating the patient for depression and pain, use an antidepressant and monitor both. You know, I, and, and, and if one thing gets better and the other thing doesn't, you haven't, you haven't won yet. Right. I mean, clearly, but the corollary of that is there have also been studies looking at people getting pain therapy on psychiatric drugs and versus not. Because it would seem it's such an obvious synergy. And I don't know if the literature has evolved that way. The only thing the literature has shown is that if you give an antidepressant to a patient with chronic pain and they have a comorbid depression, the pain may get better with or without treatment of the depression. And if, you, if they don't have a comorbid depression, the pain may still get better. So they're really, it almost, again, you know, speaking sort of uh, teleologically, it's as like, like these two separate sets of problems in the brain. And, you can, and so they interact for sure, but you can't assume that they're going to be the same. Yes? With the use of which drugs? And, yeah. So it's, it's very true. Um, so I've seen one personal one, personally one person have uh, uh, a brief episode of status, but status nonetheless from tramadol. So I think the bottom line is that the newer drugs, just like the antidepressants, just like the tricyclics themselves, anything, that, anything that's monoaminergic can produce a reduced seizure threshold. So these drugs, that's their toxicity. You have to recognize that. So if someone who has epilepsy, they probably shouldn't be used instead of a pure mu agonist. I actually personally, um, and I think in my practice, my, my group here as well, we don't use a lot of tramadol and, and um, tepentadol. We basically use pure mu agonist because we're very comfortable with it. Okay, thank you so much.